I don't know if it's harder to coach for grit or strong intuition. Can you tell me about when you went through some dry quarters in a company or some lean years and you stuck with it? What would you say you did wrong during that time period? Pricing. I didn't do a good enough job articulating the customer perspective to the people who had really strong opinions about the pricing and in business planning and marketing. I was closest to what the customers really needed. And it was my responsibility to stand up and really advocate um, for what I thought was right. Identifying your core buyer persona and your core use case has got to be priority one. So I would advise my former self to lean in to making decisions disagreeing and committing with those engaged in the decision and pressing forward at full speed on the things you've committed to do. Behind the scenes, it was a small group of people that were doing everything. Welcome back to the GTM podcast. It's your host, Scott Barker. I want to know how this insane growth actually happened. This episode is brought to you by Demandbase. Demandbase helps B2B companies hit their revenue goals using fewer resources by using the power of AI to identify and engage the accounts and buying groups most likely to purchase. Their account-based technology unites sales and marketing teams around insights that you can understand and facilitates quick actions across systems and channels to deliver big wins. It's flexible, scalable ABM built for you. Hello and welcome back to the GTM podcast. Appreciate you, appreciate you always hanging out with us every week, lending your eardrums wherever you're listening to this, at your desk, working out, doing your thing. Uh, We don't take it lightly that you get to hang out with us every week. Um, And this guest I've been excited for for quite some time now. I am joined by Elizabeth Pemrel. Elizabeth, welcome. Thank you, Scott. I've been excited too. I'm a listener. I prefer the the dog walk as my listening venue. It's great to be here. I love it. I love it that uh, I just found that out that you're a listener and that that makes me super happy. You're kind of like exactly the person that we hope listens to this podcast. So <laughs> that makes me happy. Starting with flattery is great. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do that quite a bit, I think. Um, but no, super, super pumped. And, you know, for, for the listeners, uh, I got to do a quick, quick background. So uh, Elizabeth currently si- serves as GitHub's chief revenue officer, where she oversees all facets of the company's go-to-market strategy and customer engagement. That includes sales, support, and ops. Uh, you actually joined GitHub back in 2015 uh, after a career in the public sector and has held leadership roles in almost all aspects of GitHub's enterprise business. Uh, What a run. I mean, just over nine years, nine and a half years now? Nine and a half years, that's right. Wow, wow. And you started as, I believe it was a a director, right? Actually, I came in as an individual seller. Wow. Wow. So let's see, it was 2014, towards the end of the year, and I um, got wind of an opportunity at GitHub through some friends who were working in the government tech space. And I said, you know, what's GitHub? Um, And went and Googled it and Googled it and just got really excited about what the company was doing and the mission and the problems they were solving. And so I joined in early 2015 as our first enterprise seller for public sector in the U.S. Wow. All right, I think we've got the uh, the title already from IC to CRO. I think that'll be a, a good one for the the clickbait. Um, well, that that's amazing. So, and also, and so, was that your first kind of true enterprise sales role? Then it was. I was able to convince Paul St. John, who was our sales leader at the time and a legend in the SaaS space, um, that I could figure it out. And I think what I lacked in enterprise sales experience, I made up for in my public sector knowledge. I'd been working as the general manager of a um, company based in DC, and we were running large programs for federal government. And so got to bring that knowledge over to GitHub. And so I spent the first year really just building out the infrastructure. We got on the GSA schedule. I found a reseller. I made our terms government compliant. It was a lot of the early day grunt work. Um, And then moved on to other leadership roles, you know, 
following that, I went into um, management of our East Coast team and then got to build out our team in New York and Boston and um, just really focused on scale those few, first few years. Those early days of being an IC, it's not, uh, it's not a typical IC role. Like you're, you're figuring out how to build the plane as you fly it. You know, it's like, okay, what regulatory things do we need? To, what compliance do we need? And all of these things. So I imagine you learned an absolute ton. My, my question to you, because it's something I think a lot about, and I tried to do this when I was leading teams. It's not always possible, but it's this idea of like hiring the buyer. I think sometimes the best sellers you come across have done the job that you're selling into. And it was you know similar in, in your case. You had this public sector experience. You knew it intimately. That was your world. So I imagine that was such an unfair advantage when you were talking to people uh, that were looking at GitHub. Is that a practice that you've uh, now continued when you look to hire at GitHub? Yes and no. I think at the time, especially in public sector, it was incredibly exciting because the U.S. Digital Service and 18F and these really high-skilled technologists were landing in government agencies, and they were the perfect buyers because they use GitHub, you know, long before anyone had brought it into enterprise. Today, you know, software development is so ubiquitous. GitHub candidly is fairly ubiquitous. Um, so we have this incredible benefit of having market knowledge and users that number, what, 100 million now on the platform. And so we can be fairly assured that any software developer we're talking to has, has deep expertise in the product. A hundred million users. Congrats. That's a pretty, pretty privileged thing to be able to say. I don't take that lightly. That is insane. Uh, especially for like, yeah, like a kind of B2B dev to a hundred million users. That that's how, that's like a social media company type of numbers, you know? Uh that is that is incredible. And I know GitHub has like just so much loyalty and customer love. And it must have been really cool along your journey kind of see that happen and and really come to light like was there a moment that you remember where you're like oh wow like people love what we're building and people want to be a part of it and this is going to be a crazy journey can you pinpoint that time uh, yes, it was my interview week. I would, at the time, they would fly us to San Francisco and we'd go through, I don't know, eight rounds of interviews, I think. I, I spoke to the CFO. I spoke to the head of customer success. And for me, it was a fairly risky transition. I was in this GM role at this public traded company. It was very secure. And I was going to be employee number 200-ish at this startup in San Francisco. And I was really questioning my decision on whether or not to join. And I boarded the plane home from San Francisco to D.C., six hours, right? And the woman next to me was on GitHub writing code for probably four and a half hours of that time. It was this light bulb moment that this thing was real and it was going places. And um, I snapped a lot of pictures on the sly of her using it and was texting it to everyone when I got home saying this this is the right decision. I love that. Yeah, you almost have to take a photo of that because you obviously brought that up in the interview and it sounds like it sounds like you fabricated that story. Right. You know, you're like, no, this <laughs> this actually happened. Like I I I promise. Uh that's that's amazing. Okay. So you you come in, you have a great, you know, careers and I see you get an opportunity to, you know, now go uh lead folks. Um how was that transition? You you had some management leadership position in the past, but how did you find the the jump going from an individual contributor seller, which was you know still somewhat new to you, uh, to now you know being asked to lead a team? Yeah, that's right. Because that was another transition. It was brand new to me, sales leadership, and the idea of um, driving a forecast cadence and pipeline hygiene and the things you need to inspire from your team to be good at that. And, um, you know, I was really lucky because we had hired fantastic individual contributors who were open to me being their manager and were wonderful partners to me. And I credit that to the incredibly low ego sales environment we have, we, we had then and we have now. 
And that's a vestige of Paul's leadership and, and a number of other people who have um, contributed. But when we look to hire here, we test for grit. We test for um, collaboration. We test for growth mindset. And what that means is generally folks are very team oriented, um, eager to embrace change and um, very kind. And so I love when I think about those days that that was my experience as a first manager. And today I, I really still believe that to be true. I mean, if you can take someone with grit, a growth mindset, and they're kind, like that's the trifecta of, I think, the people that we all want to work with. I, I'm curious, what is your test for grit? Uh, for me, that's, I think I've been so fortunate to be to hire a lot of folks that innately had that. And I do th think it's innate. I don't, I don't know your views on that, but it's really, really difficult to teach grit. I haven't figured out how to do it yet. If you have, I would I would love to hear it. It it reminds me of actually of the, I don't know if you watched the NVIDIA CEO talk. Uh, I think he was addressing the Harvard uh, graduating class. And he basically said, I wish you all suffering, as much suffering as possible, because that's the only way that you are going to acquire grit. And that is what is going to take you further than anything. And I thought that was like so poignant and like, it's super true. I don't know if it's harder to coach for grit or strong intuition. <laughs> that's something I struggle with. But on the grit side, and to your point about suffering, that's the test, right? Can you tell me about when you went through some dry quarters in a company or some lean years and you stuck with it? To me, one of the biggest red flags I see when I get a a referral is a resume that has multiple jumps at the 24 month mark because clearly there's got to be a really good story there about M&A or following other leaders or you hit the brick wall and you bounced. And I think as a result of testing hard for grit in our interview process, we have world class retention of our sales talent. Our attrition rates are incredibly low because we have a group of people who are not only committed to each other and the product, but who have that fortitude to hang with it when, when times are lean. Yeah. I was actually going to ask you about that. I don't know if it's just the LinkedIn algorithm for me, uh, but anecdotally and from a, a third party, it looks like no one leaves GitHub on the sales team like once they join. Like very long tenures, especially in SaaS. Like I don't see anyone leaving ever, on, uh, at least on LinkedIn. What do you attribute that to? Wonderful culture and grit <laughs> to bring it back <laughs> yeah. to our conversation. Yeah. But uh, also growth opportunity, right? It's been a phenomenal ride here. And we've had tremendous expansion in the business, not only in sort of our core sales motion, but in lots of tangential ways, like our Microsoft go-to-market, like our advanced security products we brought to market, which created a whole sort of adjacent cross-sell motion. And now our AI dominance and explosion with Copilot. And so there's lots of new things for people to explore. And we promote within extensively. Um, we just had a, a VP role about two weeks ago, and we announced an internal candidate um, had been promoted into the role after an extensive, extensive external search. We just are very, very confident in the people we have, and um, we want to keep them on the journey with us. Yeah. I mean, the compounding learning that happens, and, you know, there's conflicting views on this, particularly with the younger generation. And I'm going to say this and people are going to come at me in like comments and things. Uh, but I can easily say now that we've interviewed, you know, almost a hundred very successful execs, they all have at least one run where they were five plus years at a company. Not all of them, but a vast majority of these highly exceptional people that have the careers that we all aspire to have. And I, I think that's just because you can't actually get up to speed in an organization and even have an impact until like 18 months, if we're being honest. You know, like you're still learning. They're paying you to learn. And then, you know, maybe year two, you start to figure it out. You start really like contributing to the org. And then like years three, four, you can have this compounding effect of like, 
You know where all the dead bodies are. You know how to get things done. You figured out the internal politics of like how things move. And I think without that experience, you you develop this very shallow, maybe you can be great at your function, but you don't understand how the whole system works yet. Um, so that's something I I definitely see with the the guests we have. That's right. And then in year five, it completely changes on you for some reason. <laughs> totally. And then you're back to kindergarten again. <laughs> Acquisition or new product direction or macroeconomic environment. And so if you can stay then through years five to eight, that's your PhD in the thing, in the company, in the growth trajectory, in the customer needs. Yeah. I love it. Uh, okay. So there's so much I want to I want to talk to you and I'm trying to get my head of like where we start, but you just opened the door to um, acquisitions. So maybe we'll, we'll start there. And, you know, you've been part of both sides of sort of the M and a, uh, life cycle. Uh, obviously you had the huge acquisition by Microsoft and then the acquisition of Samuel. Um, walk me through that time period of just immense change in what you learned as a leader. Yeah. Let's talk first through the, the GitHub as acquirer portion of it. Cause I, I think that was one of the moments of most learning in my career. We, shortly after the Microsoft acquisition, had an opportunity to evaluate a, a target, a company called Semmel, and they have had world-class code scanning capabilities. And we knew we wanted to bring our customers who had source code management from GitHub, an application security portfolio of products that could sit natively within their developer tooling. There was tremendous hunger in the market for this. And Semmel was a, a great option in terms of the technology and the talent to, to bring into the GitHub family to, to, to fill that gap. And it was my first opportunity to participate in m and I was asked at the time to be the go-to-market lead in the, in the team. And it was my first time really working closely with Microsoft. So it was this tremendous education of how m and is done by one of the largest companies in the world really, really well. And just the processes and sophistication they brought um, to that experience was uh, has changed how I approach a lot of my work. Um, and then there were these really neat problems we got to think through. For example, we were building application security tooling, which was really an adjacent space to um, our current source code management system. And so we had a new buyer persona to think about. We had a very saturated competitive environment to think about. We had pricing to think through. I mean, we got some of it right. We got some of it wrong. Um, but to to go and do all of the homework required to build out that go-to-market was probably the best end-to-end -end -end education I've had uh, in my career. I imagine. And I, I bet along that journey of like, okay, we're building this entire go-to-market for this new uh, platform that we're acquiring. It, pro it Everything's connected. So I imagine you started, you know, making new inferences and guessing at different things in, in your own go-to-market uh, as well to make it all work together. What would you say you did wrong during that time period? Pricing. Pricing. We got pricing wrong. Yeah. Let's talk pricing about it. Wrong. Pricing's a big, a big one. I feel like people get that wrong all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we knew there was value. There was dissension in the ranks of the team at that point of how much value and what we felt our customers um, would be willing to pay couple of reasons we got pricing wrong. I think we underestimated the penetration of competitor tools in, in our accounts. And the motion for this SKU was going to be displacement of other SKUs, meaning our customers were going to have to free up budget to, to spend on, on GitHub Advanced Security. And um, they needed a really compelling value proposition. And so not only did we not quite nail the setting of the price, I think when I reflect personally on it, I didn't do a good enough job articulating the customer perspective to the people who had really strong opinions about the pricing and in business planning and marketing. And it was a good learning for me that I, I was closest to what the customers really needed. And it was my responsibility to stand up and really advocate um, for what I thought was right. And um, that was a, a huge takeaway that stuck with me for a long time. Yeah. And so do you think the reason why the the pricing was such a shock, was it just maybe the the risk factor of rip and replacing this already pretty sticky product was was just too high and that wasn't factored in pricing? Or maybe put another way, if you could do it differently, what do you think you would do? 
Yeah, it was partially that and also the fact that pricing is considered, any any cross-sell pricing is considered relative to your base product SKU price, right? And so I don't think we thought quite carefully enough about the value comparison customers would make between that va- that base pricing and cross-sell upsell pricing. And so what, what would I do differently? We'll take forward <laughs> that learning because as we brought additional products to market, we've we've looked much harder through that lens. Yeah, that's a super interesting uh, call out is, you know, if you go into a new market and, you know, maybe you survey all the players and all their pricing and that's, you know, typically what folks do. And they're like, okay, we'll come in, we'll be a little bit cheaper than X, but, you know, why wouldn't they? But yeah, you have to look, you have to look at the re- uh, relation between this new pricing and and your platform. And they might be deriving in their eyes way more value from this other part of your platform, but maybe it's cheaper or, and like it just blows their brain up. You know, they, they can't, can't compute it. So, But the other key learning there was we changed the pricing and it was fine. We made a mistake, we fixed it and we moved on and it was okay. And that was a great learning as well for me. And, you know, our CEO, Thomas Domka says often to us in the leadership team, there are probably only like two or three decisions a year that you can't revert, that you can't recover from. And so to view things through the lens of, you know what, we can, we can fix this if it goes wrong is very liberating uh, and creates you know, a lot of opportunity to, to test and take risk. Yeah. I mean, I think that is one of the number one learnings you can have in life and business. It's just like, okay, mistakes happen. We learn from them. We move on. And it's, you know, we're fortunate that we're not uh, doing brain surgery or anything. We're selling software, right? (laughs) We're selling software. (laughs) We're selling software, exactly. Um, Okay, that's super interesting. Um, And now, how would you, so we get a lot of startup founders that listen to this. um, And pricing is is a big one, Um, particularly now, um, you know, there's a lot of these like AI native startups, they can kind of be anything to everyone they have different icps and there's different industries that are willing to pay for for different things how do you coach startups to think about their pricing like where do you start identifying your core buyer persona and your core use case it's got to be priority one and you know for example with github copilot as we thought about creating an AI tool for developers, we knew code completion was the most important problem to solve. And so we've started there. And then we attached a a value proposition there using the lens of learnings we'd gotten from GitHub Advanced Security and lots of other go-to-market research. And we introduced GitHub Copilot, the code completion functionality to market. And we now have 1.8 million developers using it. And now it's time to say, great, how else can we use the power of AI to fuel developer creativity and productivity? Now we'll consider Copilot Enterprise features. Now we'll consider AI features in GitHub Advanced Security. But first and foremost, we viewed our initial problem through a very specific lens and set out to solve it and apply an attached value to it and prove it could be successful. 1.8 1.8 million users. So it sounds like you nailed pricing this time. You did You did get that lesson and it's stuck it, with it's you. It's going okay so far. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. So th- that's actually perfect. I'm actually going to pull forward uh, a listener question because it's too perfect for this conversation we're having right now. And I want to stick with it. Um, let me just pull it up. Okay. We've launched new platform functionality using AI, but the adoption has been slower than we hoped. I think it's due to all the noise in the market. What's your advice on cross-selling or upselling this new part of our platform? Super common right now, I think. Like any technology leader can is probably going through this similar thing. And you just did it and you just did it very successfully. Yes. And just what we were talking about, right? So it's the user persona, making sure you understand who's um, in the market already. So are you entering a very competitively saturated um, market as we talked about with GitHub Advanced Security? Who owns the budget for the new thing that you're selling? That's pretty straightforward, but really important. I think in the next year, two years, we're going to have an AI buyer persona in our enterprise customers, you know, a chief of AI. Um, And so that'll be really interesting to see how budgets and power centers within our customers shift. Um, 
And then think about the capabilities you need internally to sell the new thing. And we have a decision matrix now we go through to determine if we think a new set of features or functionality are part of our native platform story and our our sales team is equipped to go land that with customers and make customers successful, or if we need some extra horsepower, perhaps in the shape of overlay sellers. With GitHub Advanced Security, we brought in a small but very, very capable overlay team to help with the, the conversations we were having about competitive products, to help land the value proposition, to help architect the path on migrations. And that team absolutely jump-started the success of our GitHub Advanced Security business. And so it's, who's your buyer? Where's your budget? And do you have the capabilities internally to sell it successfully? AI is creating endless opportunities for sellers and the SaaS industry. As 77% of companies are either using or currently exploring AI. Still, it can be overwhelming to understand where and how to implement it properly into your tech stack. That's why our friends at Orem launched Bold Calling, their new podcast. Every episode features a prominent tech founder or sales leader, their daily challenges, and how they're using the latest technologies to solve them. Orem's AI dialing solution maximizes the amount of conversation your sellers can have while cold calling. Sellers still devote up to 30 hours per week to admin tasks, and 78% of sales professionals agree that AI can help them spend more time on the most critical tasks. Anshul Gupta, co-founder of Actively.ai, shares a game-changing solution for reclaiming that time using AI on the very first episode of Bold Calling. And if you're curious how sales and marketing leaders are actually implementing AI tools, I would highly suggest checking out episode two. They dive deep into it and it's well worth the listen. Bold Calling from Orem is available wherever you subscribe to your podcasts and be sure to check out the episode show notes to download Orem's State of AI in Sales Development Report. Now on to the episode. You said something there um, about kind of having these experts in the conversation too. I think we're we're asking a lot of our sellers these days. You know, they have to manage, you know, their whole pipeline. They're still getting up to speed on products and feature functionality all the time. And then we introduce this brand new technology that is new to just about everyone. And how important is it to GitHub to have, you can call them like, Solutions engineers, sales experts, folks that can speak deeply to a highly technical audience, because uh, you can get in some muddy waters pretty quickly uh, in AI if you know if if you're talking with someone who's very well informed. That's right. Yeah, and in fact, there are markets in which I would pre-invest solutions engineering ahead of salespeople because the point you just made, which is it is such a technical conversation. It is, it is as much a regulatory and compliance and legal conversation as it is a technical conversation. And so one thing I give tremendous credit to our regulatory and legal team here at GitHub because they have been on a global roadshow now for 18 months meeting with general counsels around the world to help explain the product and build education and knowledge around what AI is within the developer workflow and also help everybody from CISOs to chief counsels get more comfortable with how they could bring it in and bring in AI and adopt it in a really responsible way. So I'm pivoting it a little bit from technical, actually, because the more pressing need for us has been landing that compliance and legal story. So in a big enterprise deal, I guess you have like your general counsel is on the call as well yeah, like absolutely it must AI. be a huge team so it's almost like a a customer which isn't common at all like a customer facing general counsel you have at github yes absolutely yeah cool. shelly mckinley she's phenomenal and she's got a great team uh, and we we use them as our core partners in customer conversations wow wow you got my brain turning that feels like a new role that is going to become maybe that's where lawyers go everyone's saying like lawyer, lawyers are dead and things you know because like but like that seems like a really interesting evolution of the profession of like a sales engineer that is focused on regulatory and compliance uh because anyone who's using ai you will if you start selling to big enough customers you will have these conversations and you will have them fast and if you're not ready for them it's a, it's a non-starter. 
and our chief AI officer at Fortune 500 companies in the next probably five years will be the nexus of that regulatory, legal, compliance, technical, enterprise architecture point. It's going to be a fascinating conversation. Very cool. What what are those roles called? I want I want to like coin a new. T- I'm I'm excited now. Can we like coin what a new term or them? something? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hmm. We'll get there. Legal engineers, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, I love it. I love yeah. it. Perfect. Uh, no, that's super cool. And then, all right. So we're creating a few, a few new uh, jobs on this podcast today. And then you said that you think everyone's going to have a chief of AI soon. Um, just like you know, since the early days of software, you you're going to have to talk to head of security at some point, you know, and that just became the norm. And soon you're going to have to be talking to the chief of AI, you know, at at some point. Um, and maybe even more than that, you might be talking to agents that are doing a lot of like the diligence on your process. Ooh, fascinating. For you, we'll you be know. responding to them with agents. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's going to be a, a crazy world. But what do you think the the chief of AI's main, I guess, purview would be? Identifying opportunities to bring technology into the company that drives significant ROI. And that ROI will depend, of course, on what the what the company's trying to accomplish or what the government agency mission is. But I doubt there's a boardroom in corporate America right now where technology leaders aren't being asked what AI can be brought into the company to drive improvements in efficiency. And, and you know, we're having this conversation quite a bit. When we look at code completion, for example, through, through GitHub Copilot, there's tons and tons of studies available on the benefits that customers receive from um, bringing in GitHub Copilot and having developers use it. And then there's tons more questions we get asked about, well, can you, can you help me understand this specific element of our environment and what sort of productivity gains it's driving? And so we actually just having to keep thinking about how to advance our APIs to provide more information because companies are so hungry to understand the efficiency gains they're getting from AI tools. It's exciting. It's hard to keep up, um, but it, it also means there's incredible use case sprawl. So again, you've got to be really, really focused on what problems you're trying to solve. I have a, this is a question, my brain goes weird, weird places sometimes, but it's something I think a lot about and you're a great person to ask is, so the impact of GitHub's co-pilot like can't be overstated, you know, as a VC investor, you know, we're seeing folks that use GitHub co-pilot or, or things like it and the ability to build and ship code faster than ever before is literally changing everything like there is real examples where i've seen three people with co-pilots build what took an army of 40 engineers and that has widespread implications that means we might need less engineers we might need less developers in the future companies might need less capital uh give startups in my opinion uh, an advantage um how are you? You've got a front row seat at that. Like, does like are we going to need to code as much in the distant future? Is this going to create new jobs where the future people that are building and shipping, you know, products? Like, just w- what does that look like? And I'm I'm not even sure if I, I have a question other than just like, wh- how does this all play out in your eyes? Because you're you're at the front row. Yeah, to your point about the ubiquity, I mean, last year on the GitHub platform, we saw 35% of the new code generated was written by Copilot. Wow. And that was year one of really our explosive growth with this product. So think about where that's taking us next. And that will just start compounding because it, like, in a very meaningful way. That's right. And so I think, you know, to the point about, Will developers have jobs? The answer is, of course. But now they can stay in flow state longer. They get to work on more complex problems. They spend less time at administrative tasks or Googling things on Stack Overflow. I think what's even more exciting is when you think about GitHub Chat um, and GitHub Copilot Enterprise, we will increasingly offer users ways to interact with Copilot in natural language. And what that does is dramatically lower the barrier to entry for software development. So dummies like me can can just start building things. <laughs> <laughs> People like you 
or students or those from backgrounds right now that aren't well represented in software development. You know, historically, knowledge of the English language has been a prerequisite really for most development activities. That goes away with something like Copilot Chat, where you can easily switch between German and English, which our CEO does all the time. Um, and so just the tremendous opportunity to change the definition of what it means to be a developer is what's most exciting to me. So cool. So cool. It is, an, it is a fun time to be alive. I think we're going to see the most immense change that we ever have over the next, you know, two, two, three years. And it must be very cool at, to be at one of the major companies that are, are driving uh, that, that change. And it is, it's all, it's all net positive, right? Like the amount of innovation that is going to come from this is just going to be uh, extraordinary. Um, what along the way, so you did a ton right. What did you get wrong as a leader uh, through kind of the, the GitHub journey beyond that one pricing um, mistake? <laughs> If you could fly back in time and, you know, change something, what would that be? There have been moments when we've had decisions, I would say, about the trajectory of the product or the company um, that we have not made quickly enough. And so I would advise my former self to lean in to making decisions, disagreeing and committing with those engaged in the decision um, and pressing forward at full speed on the things you've committed to do. At times, indecision has created um, perhaps a, a bit of headwind to forward progress. And, and we get through that. Um, there are also have been times um, when I think our speed and explosive growth has come at the expense of foundational investment. And I think that's incredibly common in high growth companies and startups. For example, if I could go back now and re-architect our CRM from day one, that would be a tremendous <laughs> gift that I would give myself. <laughs> you and every CRO on the planet, I think. I think you're not alone. <laughs> yeah, I'd encourage everyone to just really think about investing in fundamentals and where you're going to be in 10 years when you have 45% year over year revenue growth at a company our size and what's going to need to be true for you to be successfully operating the company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, Salesforce should do something with their, their pricing so that everyone can just like get on them from, from day, from day, yeah, start <laughs> over. Yeah. Where's the start over button? Um, right. <laughs> that would be super, super helpful. Um, that's, those are great learnings. And it sounds like you've learned that from no longer fearing failure, right? So it's like just if you're going to make a decision, make it, and then you'll get more data quickly on whether it was right or wrong. And if not, then we, then we pivot from there. And, you know, sometimes making the decision will help you get to the right one instead of just having that indecision and, and not acting. That's right. And one way that comes to life in our revenue organization, we actually have a six month comp plan for our reps. And that is because the business has changed so rapidly and so consistently, um, meaning change has been so consistent in the time I've been here. We feel we can provide a much higher fidelity set of targets that are best for the company and best for our reps on a, on a six month basis. That's unique. Tell me more about that. Do, do reps like that? It's what I always get asked. <laughs> In their first year, no, because the enterprise rep wants to build to that 12-year, or excuse me, 12-month whale hunting moment, mm -hmm. right? But the reps like it when there is an unexpected change in the business and we are able to provide them protection or relief or do what is in the best interest of the rep for, for that period, and they realize, had I been on a 12-month plan, this would have ended very differently. And that's the benefit of having an incredibly tenured sales organization. They have the trust that we are always going to do right by them because they've lived that experience in a six-month period. And they also have the trust that we're going to do right by the customer. Yeah. I like that. I mean, it makes total sense. And I could imagine that becomes more 
widely adopted just because everything is changing so fast. And, you know, there's, you know, strange events like we had COVID and there's, you know, then AI comes up. There's just so many, the pace at which everything is changing, um, a calendar year feels like 10 now with the amount of things that are actually happening. And it's a ton more work for our teams. You got to do everything twice a year, but it gives us lots of opportunity to test make slight adjustments in the comp plan, really closely monitor the performance, explain it to the organization, and then make another test. And oftentimes those tests are more favorable to the reps because we're able to say, hey, that didn't work. But to the point about failing fast, good news. <laughs> we're on to the next cycle. It's only six months. Months. We're, we're and, months. We're good. You don't have to wait a whole year. Something a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah, you do. You get two times the amount of, of feedback um, on, on what's working and what's not. Um, I like that. Um, okay. So my final question, I always keep them the same. And so you can take them anywhere you want. You can highlight, um, something we've talked about or, or we can jump into something totally new. Um, but my first question is what is one widely held belief that revenue leaders believe to be true that you think is bullshit or at least no longer serving us? that there is a rep or a sales leader who's going to change the trajectory of your revenue growth because they have domain or vertical experience that is so special, it can't be replicated. And I think this ties back to the theme we've been discussing all along. Um, there is no one I could hire today that has five years of sales leadership with AI-powered development tools person doesn't exist. And so we got to make that person. And to make that person, I need a team of folks who are deeply committed to being curious, going on the journey with customers, listening and learning. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a big one. There's no silver bullet in go to market and there's no silver bullet people, you know, you, you, you build them, you find them usually over years of years of building relationships. Would you say as a, a rule of thumb, you're more in favor of, you know, uh, promoting someone internally than looking for an external or is it a blend of both? I'm in favor of both. I often find the internal candidate is the best fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think if you have the option, always the best is internal like by a pretty large margin I have found. And in my experience too, it's just like, they know the culture, they know how to get things done Out, outside hires, especially for key, you know, executive or even director plus roles. Each one will have a big impact on the, the company and the way you do business. And if you don't get it right, it can be, it can be scary. Very scary. That is one of the decisions that Thomas would say is hard to recover from. <laughs> it really, it really is. I've, I've seen it like one hire can derail an entire organization if they're senior enough, which is absolutely terrifying. I didn't think that was true early in my career. I was like, ah, you know, you just, you swap them out. But especially at that level, there's like, a, there's ability to kind of like hide what they're doing for a while. There's not, like, it's, it, it can be, it can be wild. Have, have you ever, have you made a wrong hire before? Yes. Yeah. It hasn't everybody. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. It happens. Okay. The, the final question, and I won't push you on the, the bad hire one. Well, we've all, we've all made them and we all don't want to talk about them. <laughs> I'm not volunteering any more information there. Um, okay, so going back to silver bullets, everyone knows there isn't any, but uh, we do look for them anyway. Um, very curious to hear what is one go-to-market strategy or tactic that is just working right now for GitHub and your team? We spent a bunch of time in the most recent, probably 12 months, doubling down on our customer feedback loop and investing a lot in the tools and processes that support that at GitHub. And specifically now we have all of our um, aggregated support requests, our security related incident information, 
and all of our customer feedback from the field funneled into one place for review and prioritization. And in fact, any seller or solutions engineer, anyone in the company can use the slash command in Slack, customer feedback, provide the information, and it links automatically to a repository on GitHub where we keep all of this information. And so customers obviously get the benefit of this because now we can look at this prioritized list. And last quarter, we worked on 30% of those requests and we're able to deliver them. This quarter, we've gotten it up to 40 in really close partnership with product and engineering. We're able to go back and talk to our customers about what's coming or what's not so they can make the appropriate plans. But it's super empowering for our teams, too, because they know now their feedback is going to a very specific place. It's getting reviewed. It's getting a status. It's visible to them. And they can go back and give the the customer the information they want, which just really helps with the trust and the feeling the rep or SE has that, that they can be a true advisor to their customer. It's working great for us. And I'm just so glad we decided to, to make these additional investments in the last year. Yeah. I love that. I just wrote recently of how, you know, we need to find ways to get closer to our customer. Like I think in SaaS, we all lied to ourselves for the last decade that we like truly, you know, cared and listened to them. Uh, I think we did enough uh, to keep them, but not, not for them to like fall in love with our solution. And, and I think reckoning has come for, for many. Um, and so finding that ways to make them feel heard. Uh, I want to just double click on that because I do think like customer success is having a big moment right now in in software. And it, I think the role is evolving. It is changing, uh, becoming more and more important. Um, how do you think about like the capture component of of that feedback loop? Are you, do you still do like, you know, your traditional QBRs? Um, you know, I know there's can you get feedback directly from the platform? It seems to be where things are going. So like they can just submit things digitally or like, I feel like people want their voice heard in time. Oh, I just had X problem. Like, how do you capture that feedback when they're like in that, that moment, if that makes sense? Yes. To everything you said, we, we have, um, visibility from a platform perspective that's usually abstracted, obviously, and anonymized. So we can, we, can understand trends. In terms of direct customer engagements, we have, sure, the QBRs, we have the customer advisory board. We have shared teams and shared Slack channels with a lot of our customers so they can get in touch with us immediately. Most of them, many of them have been customers for years. So they're also just going to text us and say, hey, like let's get this thing sorted out. Um, so I feel like the Ability to capture that information has never been our problem. You know, when you think about the relationship between a rep and an account who have been together for eight years, there, there's no shortage of communication back and forth. For us, the bigger challenge was the prioritization, the visibility, the, the ability to surface to engineering and product to really concrete asks that were backed by data. I feel like that's the part we're starting to nail and took us a while to figure out. Yeah, I love that. You mentioned text too that if you can get on a texting basis with your your customers you've you've nailed it you've nailed You're it in. someone You're said in. the other day like that's you want to close million dollar you know deals or investments or anything it's all done via text it's not done via email and i would agree to that when a rep shows me a text from a customer i i definitely make a value judgment on the uh, strength of that deal in the pipeline <laughs> <laughs> totally. to the positive <laughs> i love it i love it well Elizabeth, thank you so much for jumping on. I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, it's really great to to meet you and congrats on the incredible run and incredible work that uh, you've done. Anything you want to shout out? Are you? I imagine you're hiring. Uh, I bet people are going to listen to this and be like, I want to go work for Elizabeth. Um, anything going on you want to highlight? I would always love to talk to great talent that's passionate about what we're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I just want to highlight my excitement too. I mean, yes, congrats on the run, but the work is not over. Right? There are millions more people who are going to want to use Copilot and are going to learn how to be software developers on the GitHub platform. And that is super inspiring work and it's really fun. So I'm excited about what's next, the next decade. <laughs> me too. Me too. Well, when I build my first piece of software, thanks to GitHub Copilot, you're gonna have to make. It's I probably need a couple of years because you're gonna have to make it super easy for me. 
Uh, but when I do that, I'll make sure I, I let you know. I'll approve that pull request. I'll just let you know. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you again. And to all our listeners, appreciate you. Thank you for listening. Uh, I always say it, listening is one thing. Executing is totally different. Uh, so make sure you take some of these tactics, strategies, stories, apply them to your own business. And uh, we'll see you next week. 